Right now, video game budgets are through the roof. That means to maintain the best graphics, animation, and bankable formulae, only a specific set of ideas get through once you're at a certain level of production. I'm Scott from WhatCulture.com, and these are eight popular video games the industry doesn't make anymore. Number eight, 3D beat-em-ups. Where 2D brawlers saw something of a renaissance across the last few years, we haven't had a decent 3D brawler for I don't even know how long. Coming as the natural successor to 2D versions at the start of the 2000s, the idea of kicking seven bells out of random goons with an assortment of weapons and environmental attacks was a given. It's what the bouncer on PS2 was sold as, what Tekken 3 debuted as its force mode, and what Namco's own Urban Rain absolutely nailed. Even the Minority Report game was a fun physics-based brawler that nobody would ever believe telling them today. The nearest thing to a 3D brawler that we've had in a decade is Gang Beasts, which is honestly phenomenal, but the genre deserves so much more. Number 7. Games that had fun with physics Following Half-Life 2's expert demonstration of Havoc physics, everybody and their fourth cousins started developing titles where the environment itself was a weapon, or you could watch various enemies pirouette through the sky with some well-placed explosives. It was such a fun time, and Hitman 2 Silent Assassin adopted the tech, as did Max Payne 2, and the ludicrously fun PsyOps the Mind Gate Conspiracy made a whole game out of it. Crushing enemies against walls, flying around on random objects, or taking people out with a tossed piece of scaffolding to the face, few things were more straight up enjoyable. Then it became the go-to mentality that canned handcrafted animations were king, and Havoc Physics largely have taken a back seat. You saw a version of this return with LucasArts Euphoria engine in The Force Unleashed, and Rockstar did hybridize the two in their Rage engine tech, but in terms of games where a large portion of the appeal is experimenting with objects, enemies, and physics-based weapons, that stuff feels like it's long gone. Number 6. Stealth Yes, Hitman 3 just dropped, and yes, the previous two Hitman titles have been incredible, but name literally anyone else doing dedicated stealth games with a budget. IO Interactive themselves were allowed to keep the Hitman IP when they left Square Enix, and that's assumedly because Squeenix didn't think it was worth any real money. Even Ubisoft held off on another Splinter Cell for over an entire console generation because they can't think of a way to make the IP work in the modern day. No dedicated stealth with corner crouches, roof hanging, gadgets, aerial takedowns, etc. is few and far between. Sure, games like Sekiro or the rebooted Assassin's Creed let you take down a guard or two without being seen, but in both cases you're also a powerhouse of body battering prowess, so where's the incentive? Number 5. Movie Tie-Ins a consequence of your average multi-platform budget being around $20 million, and the reality of movie production schedules being nowhere near enough time to craft a decent game anymore, the days of EA releasing Lord of the Rings titles for us to play alongside the films are sadly over. Hell, it took until the Avengers to even get an 8th generation Marvel game other than Sony footing the bill for Spider-Man, and neither were connected to their respective MCU releases. Interestingly though, we are seeing some attempts at getting tie-ins going again. The Mummy Demastered is a stellar Metroidvania crafted by indie darlings way forward. John Wick's tie-in is a neat turn-based affair from Mike Bithell, and Zombieland Double Tap Road Trip was a Dead Nation-style shooter from veterans high voltage. If we're talking about titles the caliber of Chronicles of Riddick or X-Men Origins Wolverine though, it's hard to see how they could come back. AAA game creation takes at least three years to get anywhere close to top-tier visual and animation fidelity, and that that's if a movie's various production deadlines don't get overhauled in the process. The solution seems to be more games like The Mummy Demastered, smaller titles from trustworthy teams who can roll with the punches, with less to lose if entire scenes get cut or if the story shifts in the closing months of shooting. Number 4. Arcade Sports Games Sure, you can point to one release in almost 10 years, WWE Battlegrounds, as quote-unquote flying the flag for arcade sports games in the modern era, but one, the game itself was pretty damn terrible, and two, 2K only made it as a way to maintain unit cost profits in 2020 after their 2019 WWE game fell the F apart. Go back further though, and even mainline wrestling games were far more over the top. The SmackDown series used to be adored far and wide for its overblown animations and room-shaking slams. And that's before you get to EA dedicating an entire wing of their company to EA Sports Big, a label purpose-built to make the wackiest sports titles possible. From here, we got NBA Street, SSX, and Def Jam Vendetta, all larger-than-life titles with elasticated animations and satisfying game mechanics, designed to take a sport that you loved or at least enjoyed watching, and then crank it to unrealistic proportions. 
Why this approach to sports titles went away, I'll never know. Because if Rocket League proves anything, it's that people love out of nowhere twists on established rule sets that prioritize fun over all else. Number three, cover shooters. After Resident Evil 4 showcased over shoulder aiming and Gears of War locked that down to a series of waist high cover points to trade fire with enemies, it was off to the races for any other action franchise looking to cash in. Now, Gears is still going strong, but Resident Evil completely lost its way in the process, backing off from the zombies with guns fair of RE6 into a PT style reboot that got the franchise back on track. Cover shooters, though, they haven't been meaningfully iterated on in a way that stuck since the original Gears trilogy. Dark Void tried to make a vertical cover shooter where you literally were attacking enemies vertically, Dead to Rights mixed in melee combat, and Fracture tried to let you dynamically create and destroy cover, but nothing has gone the distance. In the end, for as solid as Gears 5 or the Division games are, they are boilerplate when it comes to formulaically applying lessons learned over a decade ago. Number 2. Open World Crime Sandboxes you know what's really kinda weird? For the first generation since its inception, Rockstar backed off releasing GTA games every couple of years in the 8th console cycle, and nobody stepped in to even try and take their crown. Where Saints Row's all-out crazy approach peaked with Saints 3 and 4, and Sleeping Dogs brought in Arkham Asylum's combat model to make one of the most cherished open-world crime games ever, that was about it. After a while, it feels as though most developers resigned themselves to the fact that consumers interested in open-world crime titles would just play GTA Online, so what was the point in trying to get in the way? Even Rockstar themselves sat on their laurels for five years, eventually releasing Red Dead Redemption 2 in 2018, while Saints Row totally backed off. Sleeping Dog's sequel was canned, and Mafia 3 swung and missed in bringing all those latent fans to its side of the fence. Open world design goals shifted, the Ubisoft formula took hold, and it wasn't until Zelda Breath of the Wild overhauled everything in 2017 that we're seeing another change of the guard. The Pathless and Immortals Phoenix Rising have done away with endless icon lists and towers to clear out, but can a new crime game mold itself to this freer template? Is GTA just too big a contender for anyone else to step in the ring? And number one, arcade racing games. Like the influx of arcade sports games, so too did the 2000s give us a deluge of incredibly fun, pulse-pounding arcade racing titles that were a blast to play. The most notable casualty lost in a sea of developers trying to ape GTA and take every formula open world no matter what was the divisive Burnout Paradise. Following this, it felt as though menu-based Burnout was dead along with traditional Need for Speed. And with Criterion being swallowed up by EA, some remaining devs did manage to get dangerous driving off the ground, but it's a far cry from the genre return turning overall. 2020 saw the brilliant likes of Hotshot Racing and the immaculate Inertial Drift alongside Forza Horizon getting ever closer to all-out ridiculousness, but when the only movement from bigger studios is a paltry remaster of that same Burnout Paradise, you can't help but wonder where slick arcade racers went. What happened to doing increasingly eye-popping and memorable things with the genre like the explosive Hollywood thrills of Split Second? At least those are my picks for various awesome popular video games that the industry does not seem to care about anymore. Let me know your favorites down in the comments below and please check out the What Culture Gaming podcast. For now, I've been Scott from whatculture.com and I'll catch you soon.